So conventional imaging, when we talk about conventional imaging, we're really talking about bone scans and CTs. We all recognize the limitations of bone scans and CTs. Uh, they've served us well for decades, but it misses a lot of metastases, and we know that. Patients with the PSA less than 20 is rarely positive. Um, NGI, when we talk about NGI, we're really talking about PET-CT. And I like to sort of just give this metaphor that's sort of like standard TV versus high-def TV. Um, the technology itself allows you to visualize more things. One thing I'd like to mention, though, is I cringe when I hear this term that PET or PSMA PET detects micrometastatic disease, because it gives this impression that it could detect everything. But it has its own set of limitations, and I think we need to recognize that and understand that, because that will help explain uh, some of the limitations and why we're seeing some of the results that we see today, and I think we'll have some cases later on that show some of the limitations. When it comes to NGI, we talk about PET-CT, but then we also have the radiopharmaceutical piece, which can target various processes on the cell membrane surface. So if we look at this cartoon, you see a variety of, of targets on the um, prostate cancer cell that have been you know, exploited in the past, C11 acetate, choline, uh, and whatnot. But clearly, all the attention is on PSMA uh, because it is more specific and it's overexpressed in patients with prostate cancer. So this timeline provides sort of um, various PET-CT radiopharmaceuticals that have been approved by the FDA. Sodium fluoride has been approved for decades. We saw a little bit of a resurgence in that maybe 10 years ago, but honestly, I think it's time has passed. Uh, C11 choline came from Mayo in 2011. You know, breakthrough radiopharmaceutical wasn't very widely available. Flocicoline changed a lot because it, became, it was widely available. But in 2020, uh, with the approval of gallium-68 PSMA-11, and then 2021 with uh, PSMA, I think it's really changed the landscape. So flucyclovine uh, is an amino acid analog. Uh, we won't talk too much about that. It actually performed relatively well compared to what we had in the past. And even with PSA levels, this should be less than 0 0.79. The overall detection rate was around 41%, which was pretty good. Um, but we all knew about PSMA. We've learned a lot about it at this meeting as well. Um, and PSMA, just to sort of level set, is that transmembrane protein, which is overexpressed in prostate cancer. Um, and there's high binding uh, with these radiopharmaceuticals. So this study, and I'm not going to talk too much about this because I'm sure Jeremy is going to talk about this, but it shows that its performance, even at these low PSA levels, is much better than anything that we've seen in the past. I'd also like to note that the distribution of disease is also very, very different. So all of a sudden, in patients with biochemical recurrence, you're seeing metastases in sites that you weren't used to seeing in the past. And I think this raises a lot of questions uh, about um, the disease and the, and the biology of the disease, which we have to all figure out. Um, this is another study that talks about uh, the differences between flacicoline and PSMA. Uh, Jeremy wrote this article, was first author on this. Uh, it clearly shows that PSMA performs much better than flocicoline. However, when you're dealing with the prostate bed, flocicoline did perform slightly better than PSMA, which then raises the possibility that maybe, you know, these various radio pharmaceuticals might perform in different ways and have its own set of strengths and weaknesses that we need to figure out as well. Uh, DCFPYL uh, is a small molecule um, recently approved. And the PYL uh, studies have shown great performance uh, at low PSA levels as well. So less than 0 0.5, it had a 60% positivity rate. And we'll learn more about that from Dave's talk on PYL. Uh, this is a study that comes from Mike Hoffman that looked at, looked at PSMA PET versus conventional imaging in a prospective trial. And what you saw here was the accuracy was much better than conventional imaging, had greater impact on treatment, uh, and had fewer uncertain results which is important because, you know, we all joke that the radiologist's favorite uh, tree is the hedge, and this helps us hedge less, and I think that's important because it, it reduces the frustration that our ordering physicians have uh, with these reports. This is just a, a, a chart that uh, is in press right now, but it just talks about a lot of the various PSMA-targeted radiopharmaceuticals in the works, and that should be published soon, I think, in current oncology. Uh, in summary, I think we know that prostate cancer is going to progress, and we're going to learn more about this throughout the day, and we learned more about this yesterday. Uh, NGI is useful for detecting residual disease post-initial treatment and metastases that were undetectable by conventional imaging. 
NGI is going to lead in a change in your diagnostic approach and management. Uh, the guidelines need to be optimized. Uh, we need more practical information for decision making. Current conventional imaging is still the standard of care based on its broad availability, but I think this is going to quickly change, and uh, we have to be prepared for that change. Um, growing data is accumulating regarding the improvement in outcomes with the use of NGI, and I don't want to understate the importance of outcomes data. We need to understand how the decisions change impact clinical outcomes, because if it doesn't improve clinical outcomes, you know, why are we doing it? Because there's morbidity involved with a lot of these treatments. That being said, as diagnosticians, our goal is to find the truth. And there's no doubt that PSMA PET-CT tells us the truth better. And kind of like how we all recognize that standard biopsies in prostate cancer miss a lot of these higher grade tumors, we're seeing the same thing in PET. So I think we need to embrace that sort of with that same approach that you know, we need to find what the truth is and then deal with that and improve outcomes. NGI is here to stay. And I'm going to repeat this three times in honor of my friend uh, Steve Finkelstein just to nail the point. It's here to stay, it's here to stay, it's here to stay. And it's poised to fundamentally change the medical management of prostate cancer. Steve, were you in the audience? Good. All right. All right, final thoughts. PSMA PET-CT in patients at initial diagnosis. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's obviously one of the indications and something we need to, to look at. Uh, Right now, I think negative conventional imaging is probably the first step before you go to a PSMA PET-CT, though I think in the future, maybe that initial bone scan and CT will be unnecessary, because there are ways we could perform the PET-CT that actually creates a diagnostic quality CT. I think it should be used in patients with high suspicion for metastatic disease, uh, as long as you're willing to act on the results. Uh, and those are patients who are unfavorable, intermediate, high, or very high risk, high uh, biomarker scores, or maybe, you know, some sort of risk of metastasis uh, based on nomograms. Uh, I, I wrote here 5%, but it doesn't have to be 5%. I think it's really based on your own multidisciplinary teams. I think PSMA at biochemical recurrence is something that we should consider in every patient as long as we're willing to act on those results. How we define biochemical recurrence, I think that's up for debate. You know, the Phoenix criteria, I think we're hearing a lot that maybe that's a little too late, but I think it's a, it's a very interesting discussion. So.